So here tonight, we present to you Professor and Division Coordinator of Art History and Criticism at the University of Montana, Dr. Rafael Chacon. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for this lovely invitation, and um, thanks to all of you for being here this evening. I've spent a lot of time in Glacier, and I'm, you know, it's good to know that Charlie also spent a lot of time in Glacier, and that there was a significant place for him as well. So what I'd like to do this evening is, uh, is to explore uh, Charlie Russell's work in a, kind of, in a much broader context, and that is the, the relationship with the much larger artistic movements that, were, that occurred during his lifetime. And there is here, a, there is a story, there is a, a, a kind of an, underst uh, an understood sort of consensus about that. And that is that Charlie, in some ways, was his own person. That he really was a, a realist artist, um, an academic realist artist, and sometimes the, the, the term romantic realist has been applied to him. And that essentially that he rejected uh, modern art. And that is probably true. For the most part, there were very, very exciting things happening globally uh, in Western Europe and in the United States, at, at least in, the, in uh, its infancy, at least early in the 20th century. Uh, very, very exciting things that were happening to the visual arts, and Charlie, in some ways, rejected those things. That's the given story. But there's also a meta text, and that's what I, um, what I'm trying to explore here, and what I invite you to explore. And that is, in what ways was Charlie Russell really responsive to? those bigger trends, um, and there are probably subtle responses there because we know that he was a complex individual. And so nothing with Charlie Russell was ever simple or easy or, or, uh, or simplistic. So what I want to invite us to do is to think about how these major movements as they were occurring, if there isn't really a relationship there. And uh, I don't have the answers, by the way. Again, I'm not a, a Russell scholar. And these are really more speculations on my part than they are sort of historical, you know, uh, truths. But I want to invite us all to begin to think about in what way was Charlie Russell really responding to impressions, and in what way was he open to expressions, and in what way did he was he familiar with uh, early modernism? So those are those are good questions, and I think there's probably another generation of scholars out there, hopefully, that will take up some of these uh, some of these larger questions. Because Charlie Russell was, is, we know he was a significant artist here, certainly locally, but he's also a significant artist to the entire American landscape of art that period. In some ways, he's very representative of American art in that period, not just Western art. Um, and if that's true, then he needs to be contextualized in a much broader landscape, not just Montana, not just the West, not just the United States. We need to in some ways see him as a player on a much larger global stage. So let's see what we can do with that. And I'm, I'm not sure that this is good, that I'm going to be able to prove anything here. Uh, in fact, I hope that we can actually engage these ideas, maybe actually have a little bit of a conversation, a give and take about these ideas <coughs> afterwards. So let's go ahead and uh, and jump right in. So this is what we do know about Charlie Russell. That is that I, I call him an intentional rustic. That he was not born in a log cabin. We know that. He was actually born in a quite a civilized cosmopolitan place in 1864 in, in St. Louis, and yet in his career, he actually chose a kind of rustic a character for himself, for his persona, and he also made some decisions about the kind of art that he admired and the kind of artist that he would be. And of course, what, what he did was to choose academic realism, uh, even though he was less than polished in that training, but he chose to become an academic realist. So in terms of the kind of global picture, he looked backwards, he did not look forwards. And in fact, it's hardly, uh, it, it's hard to know what, to, to what extent he looked outward in his own time. He actually looked to a, an earlier moment in American art, and that is when academic realism really was the dominant language that was understood by, by everyone as good art, great art. So he was indeed an academic realist. Um, and um, and in, in that regard, he was out of sync, admittedly out of sync with, um, with the developments of the European avant-garde. That is the front, the cutting edge or of contemporary art in his time. So by choosing to become an academic realist, he had in fact chosen against, you could argue, against the avant-garde. And of course, the, the, the bigger question is why? And, and there's, there's a question out there that I think is worth exploring is to what extent did he really know what was happening in the European avant-garde, and to what extent was he even uh, curious about what was happening there? 
I mean, there's evidence that he was later in his life, but at least at the outset, he really wanted to become a great documentary style artist. You know, paint things as you see them, as they exist in the real world, and to paint them as accurately as possible. Paint, sketch, draw, whatever medium, he wanted, in fact, to represent the world realistically. <laughs> But I, so the bigger context for me is that that there were in fact some reasons for his choosing that that particular artistic language. So and some of that had to do obviously with coming to the West um, and and the, the themes of how how to best depict what was actually happening in in the West at the time. So I think in the process of embracing academic realism, he also embraced this concept of manifest destiny. That is, that the West was, that what was happening in the West, in this place, was epic. And it needed to be described in epic terms, in a language that was visually understood by most Americans. So he, in fact, embraced a kind of painting style that was appropriate um, to, uh, to what was actually happening uh, in, uh, in, in the 19th century, the late 19th century. So painters like this, Albert Bierstadt, who we recognize as one of the, sort of the, the great painters of the Hudson River Landscape School of American Painting, painters like these would have been an inspiration to the young artist. This is, in fact, the, the, the most epic vision of the American West. And this is clearly an image that would have been burned, works like these would have been burned in the young man's mind as a, as a young artist. Um, so, Bierstadt in some ways distilled or coalesced all the ideas, the notions of what the West was uh, in, the, uh, in the 1860s, uh, late 50s, 60s, into the 70s, and later into the 19th century. This is what informs um, the, the back, this is the backdrop, if you will, for Charlie Russell's own work. And then, of course, the opening of the West, the West was, in fact, opened, uh, and, and by the time that Charlie matured and came here, it was clear that the West uh, was already a part of the nation, that it was a, a vibrant part, a growing part of the nation. And of course, the artist who in some ways best represented the West in his mind was Frederick Remington. You know, and Remington was kind of itinerant, he didn't just come to the West, he, he painted in a lot of different places. But for someone like Charlie Russell, Remington was the acme of American realism and was in some ways the best representative of what was actually taking place here in the West. And of course, the other source that we have to look to that might have inspired the young man would have been photography, which was becoming readily available. And photography was a new art form, and yet it was pervasive. It was everywhere. And, and, and the images that, that he had access to as a young man were also photographic images of the West. And that would fuel then the desire to be here, to explore, to, to take part, to actually work and live in the West and eventually settle here. So, um, so William Henry Jackson's photographs and of course his great oratory about the West and what the West meant for, uh, for the nation as a whole would have been inspirational for, for Charlie Russell. And of course, there is no more realistic art form, at least in, in a 19th century context, than photography because it was depicting in some ways the reality of the West, even though we know today that photographers manipulate light and they manipulate all kinds of things, but they were definitely forming a realist image of, of the West. That, by the way, that's William Henry Jackson, the photographer on the right, and there you see uh, one of his photographs, The Great Falls of the Yellowstone, and you see that same <laughs> photograph hanging in that train car in the back. Behind him. Okay. So of course, Thomas Moran uh, also gave us, in, in some ways, uh, uh, defined for us what the West was all about. And it was epic, and it was grand, and it was romantic in as, as a great a sense. But even by the time a work like this was painted, there was a sense that the West was not only precious, but that the West had changed. The West was not the wild, rough and tumble place that it had been for a previous generation. And of course, we know that Charlie Russell was nostalgic for that rough and tumble, wild, truly wild place. There was already a sense, e even as early as the 1830s, the land itself was transformed. So that made the West, Charlie Russell's West, even more valuable and precious. Think about it. So here, as we were developing the forestry, the industry in the West, that West was being transformed into a place that Thomas Cole in 1835 predicted is already desolate. So this is all in the, it's sort of in the back. And of course, the presence of the Indian, who's central to Charlie Russell's work as the kind of almost a central figure, opposite the cowboys, two central figures of his whole, his whole life's work, that the image of the Indian had also tra been transformed. And obviously, it's a product of the Indian wars and the displacement and, 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 and that, that, uh, that legacy. Now, this is in the 1830s. OK, 
Okay, so by the time Charlie Russell matures as an artist, the Indian was already perceived as a piece of history. Isn't that interesting? Because we look at Charlie Russell's, the Indian in Charlie Russell's paintings, and we think, oh, this is the contemporary <laughs> world that he lives in, where we see a vibrant, living uh, uh, individual. And yet, we have to imagine that by the time Charlie Russell is born, the Indian is already appearing as a monument to a doomed race. It's already in the mindset, already part of the past. So Charlie Russell, in some ways, is nostalgic, obviously, for a past that is long gone, uh, for a past that is no more in many, many contexts. But he's also in a, in a process of resurrecting that elevating the Indian to, uh, to, this, uh, to the status. He doesn't want to see the Indian disappear. And again, I'm not putting words in Charlie's mouth. I, I, I know it sounds that way. I don't really know exactly what Charlie uh, thought and believed. We don't really know precisely what he, what he thought and believed. But this is what was in the air. So. And obviously Frederick Remington also played a huge role in sort of capturing the nobility of the Indian and the nobility of, this, uh, of, a, of a way of life, but also had in his mind this idea that this was a, a part of, uh, of the past, of history. And so Charlie Russell picks up in some ways where Frederick Remington leaves off, and Remington picks up where Catlin left off in, a, in an earlier generation. So this is more typical of the status of the Indian in, uh, at the time of Charlie Russell than, than the images that we actually see in his paintings. This is a kind of a funky photograph. It's Buffalo Bill you know, in Venice and a whole posse of Indians hanging out in a canal. I mean, when was the last time you saw that, that image? But, um, the Indian had already been romanticized. The, the, the Indian already had been filtered through a nostalgic lens by the time this image was created around 1900. Okay. And of course, we know that, that th this, is, this is a real individual. That scene is probably not a real scene. It was probably a staged scene. So when we look at these images, they may look to us like realistic images of Indians and their way of life in the turn of the century. But we know that this has already been filtered through that romantic lens, <coughs> through the lens of nostalgia, and the, the lens that understands that their way of life has, in fact, already been disrupted, if not eradicated, in many, many places. So by the time Curtis came and, and, uh, and, and took the photograph of Kootenai Camp that you see there on the right, the Indians were not free to live in this way in these places any longer. OK, so let's get down to the, the nitty gritty of this. What is it that Charlie Russell, in fact, uh, rejected in, uh, in avoiding modern art? So. We know that, that he rejected Impressionism. We know he, he rejected all the post-Impressionist movements that, that occurred in France. By the way, Impressionism today, if you ask a typical American, what is your favorite art style? Today, they will say it's Impressionism. It's not realism. Okay? It's not Charlie Russell's art. They say it's Impressionism. Charlie Russell chose against Impressionism. Okay? Uh, expressionism, that is the followers of the, from the art of the turn of the century, uh, mostly the followers of Gauguin and Vincent Fein. My, my colleague who's a Dutch expert also always corrects me, it's not Van Gogh, it's Van Gogh. So that's just horrible. Okay. Anyway, uh, so he also rejected expressionism, that major, major movement of the turn of the century. And of course, the most crucial piece is he rejected abstraction non-objective abstraction. So he rejected modern art. Again, an artist who was nostalgic for a past, who looked to the themes of the past, the ideas of the past, but also the styles of the past. Not an artist who was looking at the present or looking at the future uh, and, and didn't want to be affiliated with the future. We'll see that in the end. So I'm not going to go into all these boring uh, texts, but you, you obviously know a great deal about Impressionism, what American doesn't know a great deal about Impressionism. But of course, you know that the movement actually began as a kind of a, the term was a pejorative term. The paintings were seen as unfinished. They were seen as sketches, as mere impressions, right? As compared to what? As compared to realistic images that were real solid images of the real world. So this art was seen as transitory, fleeting, as less than perfect. And so we can see why Charlie would in fact not be interested in this kind of bad art. Impressionism was first seen as bad art. I mean, it was eventually seen as pretty art, beautiful art, the best art, but in its infancy, and this is, by the way, the very, very first painting called Impressionist. I mean, and it's based on Claude Monet's uh, title, Impression Sunrise, 
And the critic, the first critics, in fact, derided this painting because it wasn't a painting. At least it wasn't a finished painting. It was, in fact, a mere impression. And those critics were not alone. Every, it seemed like every artist in the United States agreed with the, the, the harshest critics of Impressionism. In fact, I'm going to read to you another little tidbit. And this is the writings of George Innes, the great American landscape artist, and uh, in Innes' response to Impressionism as follows. And Impressionists, who from a desire to give a little objective interest in their pancake of color, let me actually bring up another wonderful impression painting. Who, from a desire to give a little objective interest in their pancake of color, seek aid from the weakness of an artist like Monet. Monet made by the power of life through another kind of humbug. For when people tell me that the painter sees nature in the way that impression is painted, I say humbug! From the lie of intent to the lie of ignorance. Monet induces the humbug of the first form and the stupidity of the second. Through malformed eyes, we see imperfectly and are subjects for the optician. Though the normally formed eye sees within degrees of distinctness and without blur, in an Impressionist work we want for good art and good eyesight. Wow, we've come a long way. I mean, from like humbug to the best art form, the most favorite art form of the day. But I suspect that Charlie Russell probably agreed with George Ennis. What he saw in this is a mess, right? A glorious mess, but a mess. And a kind of a, non, a lack of focus. And a kind of momentary quality that is really kind of tawdry. So again, I, I suspect that Charlie Russell probably what he knew of Impressionism was probably that these artists were in fact not quite finishing their work in the way that a good realist artist should finish their work. So that's a good reason to reject it. The other thing that we know about the Impressionists is that they were smitten with new compositions. So it's not just color and light that we see in Monet and, and all their, and, and their followers, it's also these new compositions which are not even Western, and I mean like Western European compositions. They're not classical Renaissance compositions, they're odd compositions. Like for example, you see that gal there with her nose up in the air, you can look up at her nostrils. So there was lots of, of this new movement to reject the color, the, uh, the, 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 the application of the paint, um, <coughs> these odd strategies of compositional strategies. So he had good cause, in fact, to reject Impressionism. But again, I, wanted, I want you to think about what did he know of Impressionism? What did he read about Impressionism? Did he see any Impressionism? And could any of that stuff work its way into his painting? That's the question really for the next PhD dissertation candidate. <laughs>